Welcome back to The Whole Person Revolution, a podcast of Comet Magazine. I'm your host, Ann Snyder, and today is a real treat. As you know, our authors are spending the summer season lingering in terrain that is more often assumed as part of the pleasant background of life than necessarily worthy of investigation, reflection, or even intentional prioritization, that terrain we call friendship. And today's podcast episode is graced by the lived wisdom of two men themselves friends, who have devoted their lives and leadership to the big questions from which the great friendships, in my experience, often take their fuel. Questions like, what is a worthy life and what is our purpose here? How do I choose a vocation that will have meaning? What does it mean to be a good person? How might our loves be well-ordered? And how does one encourage all of this to cohere? Leon Cass and Mark Schwein have not only studied and taught these questions at institutions as intellectually humane as the University of Chicago and Valparaiso, but they've lived them. And while I could spend no few hours listing their public accomplishments and ripple effects of impact in the lives of thousands upon thousands of students, I invited them on here today to get specifically at this treasure of friendship within the context of something they each, I think, have experienced to distinction. And that is the texture of a great friendship within a marriage. These days, relationships seem to be more fluid than defined, mobility, autonomy, and what I would call some confusion around the distinction between a contract and a covenant are just a few of the currents that are blurring lines and leaving some hungers roving. But there have also always been examples of fullness consecrated in the marital relationship fullness of joy, shared discovery, seeing the same truth, building and co-laboring and more that suggests friendship too, and here suggests an ideal worth pursuing or at the least being curious about. Mark and Leon each have experienced this kind of fullness. Mark with his wife, Dorothy Bass, and Leon with his wife, Amy, who died from cancer in 2015. They have each generously agreed to reflect aloud on the relationship between friendship and marriage as they've both studied and lived these great gifts. Leon and Mark, it's a privilege for me to walk a bit in the light you both cast and to try to extend it for some others. Welcome to the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Pleasure. So both of you have spent you know, decades teaching young people how to think about the good life. Where have marriage and and friendship fallen just in terms of student awareness, say, when you're in college? In my teaching in the Honors College, it's uh, hard to avoid the topics of love and friendship, which permeate a great deal of the of the readings. We deliberately set the table there with the first year being devoted to reading great works of the human imagination, philosophy, history, literature, theology. And one of the major texts very early is Aristotle's Ethics. Uh, And the chapters there on friendship we find all the time are of the deepest interest to the students. And it also provides them very early in their lives together with a very rich vocabulary for thinking about these matters. And I then have carried that on for years, that conversation beginning in the first year, in uh, one of the upper division seminars I teach, which I must say has been consistently the most popular, simply called Love and Friendship. And... uh, Students flock to that and are, uh, I'm always thrilled with this, very serious about this, very interested in knowing more about it and in thinking more about it. And the it here really has to do with friendship on the one hand, uh, romantic love on the other, marriage and how those things fit together, uh, et cetera. 
And I would have to say that I think some of my most successful teaching in the sense of provoking the deepest conversation with students and where I learn as much as they do has been uh, that particular seminar. Do you find, Mark, that they, the students lead with quite personal questions or do they engage these texts the way they might engage Plato and any other of your classes? Well, I, uh, as with any text I teach, the, the conversation begins with a close reading of the text, but leads then naturally in doing the text itself justice, which raises these profound questions in talking more directly about the texture of their own experience without getting too personal about it. Um, and their own curiosities, their own questions, what really grabs them about a particular text that they want to write about and think further about, uh, springs directly, many of them say, from the very kinds of confusions and bewilderments and questions that are most alive for them at that moment. Leon, does this map on directly to your experience or... Um, Mark has, uh, in this respect, been much more fortunate than I in teaching in a uh, religious community uh, where questions of vocation and what to make of one's life are not just things for the extracurricular or oddball courses taught by the likes of Amy and myself, but are really central to the to the to the vocation of the people who teach in Christ College. Uh, and I've uh, visited there a few times. I, I've been enormously impressed in the just in the human seriousness of these students and how closely connected, largely under Mark's guidance and his colleagues' guidance. Uh, how closely connected are their studies with the questions of life? Um, these are not academicized uh, things. When they read and study the texts for their meaning, they're not studying it as professors looking for the kinds of insights that would be shared only by other academics, but they're really mining these texts for what they might still have to teach us about our own lives. Um, at Chicago, I, f I taught the Nicomachean Ethics probably a dozen times, uh, uh, you know, 20 weeks, four hours a week, one book, and the books on friendship, uh, and they're in a way unique in the Western philosophical canon. No author before or since has spent that kind of attention on, on this subject. And we've had several, you know, rich discussions there, but they've rarely been of a personal sort because they're not out of line, but they're not sort of encouraged. Um, uh, on the subject of marriage, uh, that's just foreign territory. Amy and I somehow recognized to our astonishment that this was foreign territory um, and tried to do something about it. Uh, actually, partly as a result of a project that Mark and I were involved in in the mid 90s, uh, a project on the ethics of everyday life, in which rather than deal with all these abstruse moral conundra, we would sort of look upon the various aspects of ordinary life and uh, try to get the people to think about um, how much richness and deep meaning is found in such things as courting and marrying and in teaching and in relation to death and dying and um, in relation to work. Amy and I took courtship and marriage, and we eventually taught a couple of courses at Chicago um, and were astonished, really, that uh, if they had such an interest in marriage, it was so well protected that uh, no one would admit it to themselves that that was anywhere on their mind. Um, and I suspect the situation is worse. This course, the last time we taught it was the year 2000. So uh, a whole generation uh, has, has come and gone since then. Yeah, I... Remember um, some years ago asking 
college students in the context. These are fairly elite schools, Yale, U Chicago. They would be fairly secular, but also very sort of broadly educated. I would say they're they're sort of they're studying the great human questions. Um, Still, and whenever they were becoming more articulate on on questions of vocation, the deep why of their lives as it pertained to work, uh, some some articulacy and and deep longing to understand what it meant to really commit and submit oneself to a community. But as soon as I would bring up marriage as just a question mark as like one of those very major life decisions, I remember vividly this just captured it. One young man said to me, "Oh." marriage, yeah, I think that's just a package that's going to come in the mail when I'm like 36 or 38. (laughs) And it was like that sense of put it off, put it off. Um, And I've never quite forgotten. I think it just, it reflects a little bit the, perhaps the parenting priorities and what's named as a, as a real value, at least in the American context and notions of success. When we did this class on courting and marrying was the class based on this anthology we produced. I mean, the first day of class, uh, you know, one young man said the the thought of being married to the same woman for 25 years is preposterous. Another young woman said, uh, yeah, casual sex between men and women is really wonderful uh, because it gets the sex thing out of the way so we can be friends in ways that we never could before. And a young woman said, uh, you know, we we know we're not supposed to get married until we're at least 28. Um, So all of our relationships are supposed to be impermanent. This was the first day of, of, of class. And I came home. I told Amy, I'm not going back in there. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a lion's den. <laughs> and she said, she said, don't worry. Um, those, those opinions are just skin deep. We'll do what we always do. We'll do the reading. You'll see. By the way, where I am in Israel, absolutely the opposite. It's, it's, uh, it's expected. You, you somehow pay forward the, uh, um, for the gift of life that you were given. It's not just marriage, but children come with this. Whereas in America, uh, you know, do you want to have children is, uh, you know, as much question as do you want to go to South America or the North Pole? Um, right. It's a life choice. Yeah, radical autonomy over here. <laughs> I went to Wheaton College in Illinois where there is this at least shared faith, even though it felt like you could ask any question on earth and doubt was welcomed and it was, I would say, very robust sort of intellectual freedom. Um, But we were always in the dining hall asking some of these. And shortly after that, I was, you know, thrust into the sea of adult life like everybody is. And um, very fortunately, uh, this is really a grace in my life, I was exposed to these anthologies right after college that you both... um, had a hand in creating and editing, Mark, yours, Leading Lives That Matter, What We Should Do and Who We Should Be. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've dog-eared that and (laughs) written it all up around all manner of questions that relate to deep sort of issues of discernment. And then, Leon, you mentioned this a little, but your and Amy's Wing to Wing, Or to Or, readings on courting and marrying, um, as well as your own Being Human, core readings in the humanities. I was asking questions around the summon life. What is the sort of moral terrain of our human longings and what do they reveal to us about about the nature of the good and the role of suffering and pain that can shape us in our future commitments? Um, How do we think about heroism, good and false and all that? And uh, in this wide range of large questions, I think, Leon, you really concretized this for me, but you just got very concrete at a very pivotal time in my own life and said, you know, if you really want to at least shape the scaffolding of a full good life, you've got to think about four major areas, meaningful work, devotion to rings of communities, including one's country, um, the pursuit of understanding and wisdom throughout a lifetime. When you think about those last two domains, friendship and marriage, and then you reflect upon you know, the great fortune I think each of you have had to have experienced a great friendship in the context of marriage. Does that possibility of a great and growing friendship in the context of a great and growing marriage, is that a function of actually all these other major domains interconnecting? Like, is there something about having one's loves awakened and educated to pursue all the core domains of a life such that when you get to share a life with another, actually at some level you feel they are 
all integrated? I don't know. That's sort of a large question, but I'd just love to hear you reflect on that as holistically as you can. Mark, would you go first? Because I, I sure, please. I do think that yes, the uh, there's a reciprocity uh, among all of these different loves and forms of community that you outlined. But I think it's hard to say uh, which comes first and which comes second, which is primary, which secondary in terms of the unfolding of a uh, worthy human life. Leon and I were having a bit of a conversation along these lines when we talked uh, about a week ago, just the two of us, wondering aloud whether uh, friendship is, in a sense, essential to good marriages. Uh, are, are steady wholesome, uh, flourishing marriages, uh, relationships that need to have uh, at their core some kind of friendship, uh, or are there other models for steady, flourishing marriages? That was one question. But in the context of that conversation, I did uh, suggest that those relationships that begin in friendship and later flower into more erotic forms of love seem to me in my own experience of greater duration, permanence, and depth than those that begin the other way around. You're simply smitten. There's a kind of high erotic charge, which may or may not flower at, in addition into a friendship. And, and sometimes they do. I'm not going to deny that some relationships that have begun with Eros as the driving principle uh, have eventually grown into friendships that are rich and enduring. But I do think that the kind of love that's grounded in choice and in its highest and best form is directed toward the characters of the two people, which are finally more sturdy and stable uh, than the kinds of things that make for erotic attachment. Uh, that's why Aristotle says the highest and best forms of friendship involve sharing thoughts and speeches, not sharing bodily fluids. So in other words, he, he understands what's durable and what's worthy of admiration, regard, affection, and of course, that kind of love called philia. Um, but to get to your larger question about communities and other loves, and if you have a good marriage, does that tend to enable the other ones in turn to grow richer and deeper? Uh, I think that's probably true, but I do think it's reciprocal. There, there's no question that in my own case and in Dorothy's own case, um, a, a large part of our marriage being strong is that we were raised in families that were themselves strong, extended networks of people, not just our parents, but siblings, and beyond that, schools, and perhaps most important, churches, all of whom in their own ways reinforced the importance of friendship, marriage, faithfulness um, in a way that I think we need it. It really does take multiple communities to create the fertile ground for these things to flourish. Yeah. Not that people haven't come from terrible conditions and nonetheless found life-giving relationships, but I think in general, that whole ecology of institutions um, is what makes for the possibility of a lot of flourishing marriages. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem to know whether the culture deteriorated first and crippled people to the point that they can't form good friendships or whether friendships and marriages eroded first and led to the crippling of the culture. It's obviously a dialectical a historical situation and pattern. But to get at the heart of your question, these various loves and loyalties and communities are deeply interconnected and interdependent. I like what you say, Mark, the different uh, avenues, the different domains in which one makes a, one tries to make oneself a worthy life um, is certainly uh, can be sustained by um, 
a deep love and the, the solidity of the friendship which is there. Um, but uh, one shouldn't simply, I think, um, harmonize all of these things because uh, certainly at an early stage of my life, pouring my uh, energies into teaching was often at the expense of my home and lots of ambitious people who are out doing the work of the community, put their families second or third. It may be that uh, a similar kind of uh, network of values, uh, religiously informed or informed by some view of the good, uh, may illuminate all of them. But these domains demand so much of our devotion that the other domains are relatively neglected. And I, th I think that that sort of deserves uh, at least to be raised here. Uh, actually, Amy and I used to disagree about this. I thought friendship in marriage couldn't be counted on. There were lots of strong marriages between people who weren't best friends in the ordinary sense. Uh, their best friends might be uh, for for the uh, for the wife an old girlfriend with whom she'd grown up, for the for the man uh, uh, likewise, uh, uh, you know, uh, an army buddy or something like that. The marriages were strong, uh, and um, Amy kept insisting now that uh, this was absolutely indispensable. And over the years, I think. I think she persuaded me, and she persuaded me while she was alive. So she knows she persuaded me. It's not, it's not that I've discovered the, in her absence that I'm missing on all counts. But I, I do think um, we have to lean in, and we haven't so far, on actually what this thing called friendship is. I mean, it's a wonderful term. Uh, we all salute it. We embrace it. It's precious. But there really are, there are really, even amongst the friendship of people who admire one another's characters, there are different activities that they share. And they're not, as Aristotle would have it necessarily, the kind of friendship of sharing thoughts and speeches which for him was the philosophical friendship. I mean, the friendship of ideas, not sharing thoughts and speeches about who's going to pick up the kids after school um, and other thoughts and speeches, which are very much the, the, the speeches of domestic life where necessity is necessarily a very large thing. And I would say, and I don't know what you think about it, Mark, when I was younger, I really thought that the best sort of friendships and the friendships, were, were, that they, they were the kind of conversations about ideas and that these things made the most difference. But over time, um, it's the shared activities of living together, of shared memories, of a life cycle, of shared sorrows and joys, of common sensibilities, and increasingly um, in old age, having people who've lived in the same world that you've lived in, to have contemporaries when the world changes every 10 years and you don't recognize it. And um, the America of growing up after World War II is not the America of growing up after 9-11 uh, in lots of different ways. My granddaughters don't live in the same world that I do. So um, some of the things that make really for deep friendships are less articulate and more, I don't know how to put it, just shared sensibilities, the feeling that we understand certain sorts of things, sometimes without even having to speak them. I would, I would certainly concur with that. I, when I think of sharing thoughts and speeches, <clears throat> I think of it a bit differently from the way Aristotle intended, which is simply having the kind of conversations about things that mutually matter that tend to strengthen the character of the entire relationship. I mean, I love the image in C.S. Lewis's Four Loves, where he says that lovers 
are always face to face and friends are always side by side facing things of common interest and common love. And I think there's something very uh, wise about that. Moreover, I think that some of my favorite books on marriage and friendship, War and Peace, the, those marriages that are flowering in the first epilogue are largely the byproduct, not of sharing philosophical thoughts and speeches, but having shared what seems at that point when you see them together at the end, those two couples, almost a lifetime of hardship, sorrow, triumph, loss, pain, you name it. Uh, and, and, and they've come at uh, this long last to a situation where the strength of what they have together is very much a byproduct of having shared and endured and enlivened and enriched that whole very complicated history. Um, and that's why our present day is so pathetic that you can actually talk of friending someone on Facebook. This becomes then a verb, and it means clicking a mouse as though you can suddenly befriend somebody with a click, whereas really the kind of friendship that you find so moving and marriage and war and peace took years of suffering and hardship and obstacles and not just a pinch of salt, but a lifetime of uh, joy and sorrow together. Yeah. And by the way, and children. Yes. And children, of course. Which uh, uh, our, our friend Aristotle um, has, uh, I'm probably the only person I know who loves that chapter on the friendship of husband and wife. It's utterly cold. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's pleasant and it's useful. And actually, they could even be friends for their virtue if they're decent. And then he goes on to say, um, and children are the bond, for they are the common good, a good common to both. It's the only place in the whole ethics where the notion of common good is stated. And um, this is, I think, underrated uh, in the thoughts about these things. Even when people start talking about love and friendship, it's generally still we two against the multitude. But really the heart of this and the place where the two lives are joined in a way in which neither sexuality or I would even want to say conversation that um, this is our commingled being sort of sent forth into the world as our replacement. Um, and it is, um, uh, look, this is an idealized picture. We mess it up against our best intentions. But um, this is a friendship that you can have with no other person than the ones with whom you have reared children. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to say that there aren't deep marriages who don't, who, that are childless, but this is, um, this I would not have said as a young person. Um, but it's, uh, you know, Amy and I taught together, we wrote books together, we talked endlessly about things. And um, the thing about which she was the only person in the world I could talk to when I had heavy heart was about the children and the grandchildren. And that was, that was ours. Yeah, it's very sacred, right? What you just said there, Leon. Part of the animation behind this focus of Comet Magazine this summer on this is in the context of most of us emerging out of a few years of kind of a strange pandemic and forced set of distance. And I think a lot of people have revisited 
or maybe have visited for the first time, relationships, what is the value of certain friendships, you know, notions of, notions of quantity, notions of, um, transaction. We're trying to understand like the, almost like the societal substrate of friendship these days. Some younger millennials were informing me that there's this huge trend happening, and this again is probably mostly in the American context, um, about people wanting to establish, quote, friendship contracts, something in paper, something in writing that suggests uh, commitment and also has some rules of relating as well as rules of when there is an infraction I don't know if for forgiveness is ever woven into these, but there's sort of an exit ramp. And I found this, to be honest, both initially like disturbing and very intriguing insofar as what it says about the timeless human longing to be held and to be secure relationally. Also, maybe some desire for public witness. I don't know if these contracts are signed with witnesses, but it sort of speaks of just a different terrain than I have ordinarily thought of committed friendships, which seems sacred precisely because there is this element of freedom and privacy, but also it's public, but not in an official boundaried way. Um, so in all of that, something like this is happening over and above. Obviously, we all know marriages are not, there are far fewer marriages happening. When people are getting married, they're getting married quite a bit later. Um, this desire to sort of grope towards some kind of covenant, but still in the language of transaction around something as organic as friendship. Well, I I have to admit, uh, Anne, that I didn't know about this idea okay. of a friendship contract. I must say that initially, friendship contract strikes me as an oxymoron. Uh, that is to say, uh, again, to quote Aristotle, he says something like, and I haven't taught this for 10 years, uh, in friendships, there in, in a way is no need of justice. That is mm -hmm. to say, of, of rules, of agreements, of written down codified principles, etc. cetera. Um, and it seems to me that what it might be happening, I'm only speculating, is that there's such little trust in our culture. Uh, there's such little trust in other people and unwillingness to take risks in trusting someone until they've proven themselves trustworthy that you even need further guarantees the feeble effort of law to somehow solidify and surround and strengthen these friendships, which have to be, in my view, much more organic and growing out of all of these mutual issues of the human soul and their relationships to one another, rather than from some externalities that's going to somehow bond and ensure the uh, continuity of the friendship. So I would say my short answer to what I think about friendship contract is that it's an oxymoron. Yeah, I'm with you, Mark. I think your analysis is sound. I always am, am sort of stunned when I hear it, where people talk about their friends in terms of so-and-so is there for me, and which they are, they're need-based. And they are, you need your friends because you are lonely, you are um, uh, vulnerable, and it's not that you've somehow sought out your friends because you find them attractive to be with and, and spending time with, but you're concerned about uh, people who will um, take care of your wounds. Um, and if that's the case, uh, then there's a concern that, you know, the, well, um, you might be going on to somebody else's wounds or you might get tired of my wounds. And that the, the concern really is that my needs will not be uh, satisfied. Whereas I think in the more traditional understanding of friendship, friendship is entirely gratuitous. Um, it's... Uh, so that the friends, in a way, are friends not because they ask anything of one another, but in the best, I'm not talking about the friendship of utility, but the, the, the friendship of people who admire each other, who like one another's company, they're there entirely freely. And 
in a way unlike marriages where there are needs um, and often demands which uh, have to be answered to and that are not gratuitous. You have certain obligations. There's a much greater freedom of friendship and the idea that you would somehow have to write this down as if it's going to escape is uh, a kind of declaration of the misunderstanding of what kind of a relationship this this is. It may also be because having given up all thoughts of being married, they are really thrown into the world absolutely as isolates and want something that would be somehow a substitute for it as a kind of identity of yeah, um, we are somehow together. I am here, uh, but it's it's bizarre, at least to to my very ancient way of thinking about this. Not that ancient, Leon. Uh, I do think it reveals something quite interesting and worth paying attention to in our moment. I think something is going on of which this would never have occurred to me until you 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 brought it forth. But there is something in this post COVID circumstances. I don't know about the young. I, I, I really don't know. I know my grandchildren, but not much more. But there is a way in which lots of people have, by necessity, interrupted a lot of relationships. And when they reform them, many of them are taking the trouble to say, these are the relationships that really mean something to me. You know, the other ones, it was too bad, but I didn't really miss them. And I get the sense of of people, not just at my age, but younger, who are saying, I, there's not enough time to spend except with the people I really want to spend time with. I mean, that's, that's in a way, um, the appreciation of the preciousness of one's time and what one gives it to is very often lacking in a in a prosperous and busy culture like ours. So there is a possibility that there could be a deepening of friendships and associations insofar as people are now more mindful of what they really were missing when they were just stuck at home. I I totally agree, Leon, and I am seeing that. I want to broaden the tent here a little. You both have mentioned Aristotle quite a bit, and that kind of brought to mind just this curiosity. Uh, Leon, you are now teaching, and your or your your dean of uh, Shalem College in Israel, and um, but you have a long experience in the U.S. context. And Mark, you're in wonderful Valparaiso, Indiana, um, each coming from distinct religious traditions both in your study and just sort of observation of different subcultural communities, would you um, say that the Jewish tradition shed sort of distinctive light on friendship, if any, that could, might be at all distinct from the portrait Christianity paints or where is their overlap? And how do these, if we could maybe say more Judeo-Christian sort of ideals or norms around friendship, um, both overlap with Greek ideals and then perhaps be slightly set apart? Let me start. Let me tackle the Jewish. If Mark will do the Christian, um, and we'll see where we come out. I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, <laughs> I would have said, and still will start by saying that the Jewish tradition is not big on friendship. The Hebrew Bible has two famous friendships: David and Jonathan, and Ruth and Naomi. There's, I think, only one third friendship mentioned. Judah and an Adullamite fellow when he leaves his brothers, relatively minor. And uh, I would say that, um, and the story of Ruth uh, and Naomi, which the, the great speech of that text, whither thou goest, I will go, etc. It's a great speech of, of female friendship. Uh, Ruth offers that to Naomi. Naomi doesn't say a word. Uh, she doesn't respond, thank you very much. Naomi holds out the hope that Ruth is going to get married rather than stay married to her. And that's in a way, I think, in the keeping with the general 
biblical presumption in favor of marriage over friendship and especially over male friendship, uh, the friendship of the warrior class and so on. The, the vocation is transmission, transmission of a way of life from parents to children. I mean, there's a lot to be said about that, but um, the friendship of the Greeks before Aristotle got to them was the friendship of the warriors. Achilles and Patroclus is the great and glorious friendship. Tragic, by the way, uh, necessarily tragic because only one of them could be best. Um, but uh, so I would have I would have stopped at this point. But then there are these traditions of of chavruta, which comes from the word chaver, which means friend, which are the associations of the study of of, of Torah, of Talmud, uh, where um, young men spend years and years, and now young women spend years and years, one-on-one -on -one in small groups, simply morning till night, studying text. Mm. And that the friendship is informed in a very different kind of way. And the third thing, and this I didn't really appreciate sufficiently, um, there is uh, not so much the dyadic emphasis on friendship, though Jews are friends like everybody else, but there is a very strong sense of the community responsibility of the sort that friends generally exercise for each, uh, towards each other. So it's I mean, there's much less focus on the theme of friendship right. in the sources, but the practices are considerable. And in the community, the community somehow understands that um, they are one. Mm. And um, someone dies, everybody gathers, people bring food. If you say thank you very much, they say this is what the community does. And in that sense, there is something like the ideal of friendship. Um, people pray together. People look out for one another. Um, and um, I don't think you have that in the Greeks. Well, this is an enormously complicated matter. Uh, Christianity's uh, thinking about friendship uh, changes considerably over the millennia in the sense that Initially, of course, uh, the best of the early thinking of people like Paul and even some of the gospel writers is shaped by a sense that the world has not got long to last. The parousia, the end times could be upon us any moment. And so there wasn't a lot of diligent attention given to the forging of relationships that were going to last more than simply just a few years uh, so that people could collectively ready themselves for the end times. Well, that changes dramatically as Christianity uh, now becomes the official religion in the fourth century, and you get Christian thinkers uh, by the droves returning to fundamental questions like friendships. I mean, the wonderful passages on Augustine's friendship with Nebridius and his sense of loss over that and whether or not that love was part of a disordered love and that it was too intense. And that's where we get the formulations of loving the friend in God uh, or the spouse in God, etc., uh, and then, of course, you get Aquinas recovering Aristotle, and uh, before that, Aylward of Raveau writing about spiritual friendship. So Christianity has to kind of get over an initial period of almost indifference to any kind of earthly attachment, to trying to relocate and recover and enrich earlier conceptions of that. Uh, with a kind of injunction from Jesus of Nazareth, who finally says to his disciples, I now call you my friends. Uh, and there's a kind of even testing of uh, Peter, uh, whether he loves him in all three ways, not just not just one. Uh, but those are small reads to hang whole views of friendship on. Uh, nonetheless, they're recovered as the idea of friendship develops to the point, Leon, where I, where I think that by the time of the Reformation, when you get uh, Luther and others and the whole notion 
a robust notion of vocation. I agree with Charles Taylor, who says that for Christians in the early modern period, the two domains that provide meaning and purpose to a human life, the two earthly domains, are what he calls production and reproduction. That is work and family. That is children and that to which you devote your life to as some kind of purposeful breadwinning activity. And so I think that uh, it really depends on at what point you slice into the Christian tradition. Um, I'm raised a Protestant, so I was very much raised to think production, reproduction. And to get back to a much earlier point you made, Leon, uh, in our world, those two realms often come into conflict. That is to say, one devotes too much time to work at the expense of family. Uh, when Dorothy and I prepared Leading Lives That Matter, the questions that organized it came from the students. We asked them to list them. And the one that was most on their mind was this whole question of a balanced life, the whole question of how, because many of them were raised by workaholic parents and were bound and determined not to let that happen to them. Um, so anyway, production, reproduction, that's, a, 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 I don't like exactly that way of putting it. Um, I, I, but nonetheless, I do think that it, when you get into the early modern period and the Reformation, you have something much more akin to uh, the, the the very deep strengths of the of the Jewish tradition that you talk about so wonderfully more recently in your in your book on Ruth. Thanks, Mark. If each of you, I imagine you've had a, you know a wide range of friendships throughout your lives, vocationally in marriage, as we've discussed, neighbors, shared cause. Etc. Um, and I imagine you know friendships change in many ways throughout the life stages. As you like, let your brain kind of scan through the richness of that tapestry. Could you just name some of the the most enduring gifts that the strongest friendships have given you? It's hard to know where to begin, really, <laughs> uh, because these. Uh, as Leon said, they come as gifts, and so you feel nothing but gratitude for the abundance. Certainly the love that uh, you're privileged to receive from these friends, and certainly from your marriage partner, is got to be foremost uh, on the list. I do think that the kind of sympathetic understanding that doesn't even need to be articulated the kind of confidence that you have that's unquestioned that someone is always there who's going to understand you and provide, uh, not that you don't argue and not that you don't uh, criticize one another, but that when the chips are down, you know where you're going to turn. I mean, that's that's something many, many people don't have. I do think I would list the kind of enrichment that happens in that companionship of your own soul, I think you can feel its depth um, significantly different, uh, and you feel yourself enlarged um, by the presence of this other person whom you often can't distinguish from yourself in the most intimate relationships. Um, going outside of marriage, it's very interesting because the blessings vary depending on the friendship. Um, one thing I actually like about Aristotle is that his concept of friendship is so elastic. I, I just have some great fishing buddies, uh, and that's it. They're fishing buddies. But one of my friendships is my high school friendship, a guy named Joe, who has very little in common with me except that we've been through a lot together and still phone each other twice a month after all these years. And that's a kind of blessing of someone who has shared a history uh, so that you can reminisce and remember together your life and have a whole lot of blessings that really no other friendship, including the friendship I have with Dorothy, can begin to touch because uh, Joe and I have been together 
over 60 years um, be, when we began to hang around in high school. So it really does depend a little bit to make a list of the blessings on which friendship in my life you're talking about. Uh, very beautifully put, Mark. Um, and I would concur in absolutely everything that you've said. I mean, when you're young, you have no idea. If you're lucky, you might get to the point that you that you'd say it's the most unbelievable thing that someone has chosen to spend their life with me and has placed the kind of trust and confidence to say i'll get in the boat with you come what may um and it, even to speak about it is to articulate something that's sort of in the warp and woof of, of just being alive with such a person. You don't think about it, but it makes, it makes all kinds of things possible that um, there's a certain acceptance, there's a certain ratification, there's a certain willingness to walk this road, come what may. And that kind of uh, that kind of trust and confidence enables one, in a way, to face just about everything that's in the world. It's an astonishing thing. It's you don't count on it. You don't you don't know it's there, but it's uh, and it's it's an extraordinary gift. In our anthology, we have um, we have. Uh, a selection from Kierkegaard's stages on a life's way on a married man. And I, 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 it never occurred to me, but he, at one point he says, faith in marriage is the only thing that makes a man lovable. And somehow placing your trust in this relation with no exit ramps, of course, the, sometimes exits are necessary, understood, but um, to basically go all in, to say, I trust this relation, and that is somehow who I will be from now on. That, that makes the world possible. That, that, I think, is the best I can do. Mark, Mark said wonderful things. And so did you, Leon. Thank you. Yeah, that was quite a benediction, both of you. Thank you so much for coming on here to talk about this. As I mentioned at the outset, you really, both of your sort of life output or a slice of it has had a big impact on me and many people that I love and admire. So the ripple effects, in many ways, there have been many friendships created exactly around um, the questions that you all have spent such courageous time and somewhat countercultural time seeking to crystallize and open up in creative ways for the impressionable times of our lives that wind up yielding seeds that yield fruits many, many decades hence. Um, so just thank you. And thank you for your time here. To well, thank you this. very much for arranging all of this, Anne. Uh, Leon and I are especially grateful because we've now resumed our conversations. And <laughs> uh, I thank you for putting together such an interesting issue of comment for this summer. Well, you're right in there, Mark. I can't wait to share it with the, with the world. Amen to that. And it's really wonderful to spend this time with you, Mark. Really, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Whole Person Revolution podcast, which is as much a cultural compass for comment as it is an incarnate witness of the hope we explore in our pages. Like what you heard? Check out this podcast intellectual seedbed at www.comment.org, where you'll find an artistic rendering of essays that shed light on the very real shadows afflicting the peace of our commons today, but also the many cracks of light. And consider joining us. You can write, you can read, you can host a comment supper in your neighborhood, or you can suggest questions that are pressing upon your desire to be an agent of grace and truth and gentleness and trustworthiness. We want to hear from you and we need to learn from you. Write to us at comment at cardis.ca and expect a sincere exchange. We're honored to have you within our orbit and to pilgrim together toward wholeness in a world splintering against it. The Whole Person Revolution is hosted by Comet Magazine, produced and with original music by Ali Crummy, 
Audience Strategy by Matt Crummy. I'm Ann Snyder, and I'll see you next week.